it's easier if you specialize or if you niche and then, you know, it helps you increase your price, which then enables you to hire more people and they're more efficient, right? If they're doing the same process over and over again, instead of coming to work every day, like, what am I doing today? Is it going to be this or this other thing over here? Welcome to Profit and Prosper, a podcast for entrepreneurs who are ready to make some money while doing what they love. On this podcast, we're going to pull back the curtain and talk about all things business and money, but I promise you this is not your typical boring numbers talk. I'm your host, Sarah Young, a CPA and CFO with over a decade of experience in finance, business, and leadership. I'm going to share everything I've learned from helping my clients grow more profitable businesses and keep more of what they earn while growing my own successful business along the way. You'll feel empowered and confident that you too can grow your wealth, live a rich life, and have an impact. Stick with me and you might even start to think that finance is fun. Let's dive in. Welcome back, y'all. This week, I have an amazing interview for you with Natalie Eckjall of Biz Chicks. Natalie's podcast is the Biz Chicks podcast, and it is one of the longer running business podcasts that I think is out there. Um, I know she started it in 2014, and it was one of the first podcasts that I ever started listening to back when I found podcasts and started listening to business podcasts. This was a few years ago. So I am really pumped to have her on the podcast this week. We talked about all things specializing and niching. So Natalie has been running her business for well over a decade at this point. Her business is Biz Chicks, and she helps service entrepreneurs build enduring businesses that are enjoyable, profitable, and sustainable. And you'll hear us talk about this in the episode, but Similar to me, she is also really passionate about helping women business owners be able to pay themselves a six-figure salary because she knows as well as I know um, how impactful that is for women to be able to pay themselves that much. And it allows you to truly build wealth and you know take care of your family and really live the life that you want to live. So this episode is so good. We talked about all things, you know, specializing and niching in your business. We talked about the mindset factors that prevent people from wanting to specialize in niche, but then we went into, you know, all of the benefits of doing this from being able to charge higher prices to having an easier time selling um, because you are niched down into, um, you know, a specific set of who you serve or what you do. And it's easier for you to communicate the value that you provide And it's also easier and more profitable because your back end processes and systems and things that you do are more efficient. You're not doing, you know, 8,000 different things. You're doing a handful of things really, really well. And you can then hire and train team members so much easier um, because you have those consistent processes. So this is such a good topic. And I think everybody really needs to think about doing this in your business. Um, and it's something I certainly did not do when I started, but we have specialized and niched as my business grows. And I think we will honestly continue to do that. And Natalie also gave some of her best tips for exactly what to do next if you do want to specialize and niche. So I'm excited for you to give this episode a listen. Let's dive in. Welcome back to this week's episode, y'all. I'm super excited to have Natalie on with us today. Natalie, thank you so much for being here. Sarah, thank you so much for having me. So first things first, you know, I think a lot of listeners probably already maybe listened to your podcast because it is one of the longest running and, you know, highest rated podcasts for women business owners that I've come across. I certainly started listening to it in the early days of my business. So I'm kind of like excited to talk to you just for that reason. But, um, you know, for those of you or for those of the listeners who haven't found you yet, tell us who you are and what you do. Oh, thank you. I uh, I never assume anyone has listened, but uh, it's always fun to talk to people that that do. 
Uh, I host the Biz Chicks podcast and I uh, started it in 2014. Uh, as we're recording this, I'm coming up on nine years of hosting it, which has been really amazing. And it has changed and evolved over the years and even my intentions for it have as well. And currently, uh, I work with uh, service-based business owners, primarily consultants, coaches, and marketers. And I run a group coaching program for them where I help them go from multi-five figures to multi-six figures so they can pay themselves eight to $10,000 a month, which is, I really care about, and I know you do too, about the bottom line and what people are actually taking home. And uh, so that's that's how we, we support them through that group coaching program. I've had my own businesses. I started my first business when I was in high school. I was a private swimming instructor. I learned so much from that business <laughs> that I bring into work today. Uh, and then after college, I worked uh, for a marketing research agency, for an international public relations firm, for a general contractor. And for um, after I got my MBA, I worked as a management consultant. So I have a lot, I have a lot of depth and breadth in different um, industries. And I have three children who range in age from eight to 20. And so uh, with them, I have visited lots of different service providers <laughs> um, and activities. And so I just have a, I feel like I bring a, a deep business background to my work. And I don't believe in fads and I don't, we don't do the latest, whatever it is. I've watched them all come and go. I've been in the online space since about 2010. So I've watched a lot of things change and I've seen what works and what doesn't. And I've seen scams and I've seen all the things. So in my work, we work with clients and teach them, you know, business strategies that are time tested and uh, that they can count on and they don't have to adjust, you know, next week. I think all that is amazing. And you have such a great background. And that's one of the many reasons why I'm just super pumped to talk about this topic of specializing and niching. But mm -hmm. Before we jump into that, one of the things that you said was that your focus is on helping women business owners pay themselves eight to 10K a month, which would be $100,000 a year. Mm -hmm. Why is that your focus? I've worked with women, you know, over the years at different phases of their business. And I've, I've watched women not focus on paying themselves. And the reason that number is important to me is because once you're making 100K a year, which I have personally made in the marketplace, I believe you have too, knowing your background, it allows you to impact your family, your community, and your future in a different way. And it gives you buying power, so to speak, in the household. So if you have a partner and you are making far less than they are, then your work, depending on how your relationship rolls, but I've seen a lot of them over the years, it changes how serious your business is taken. So if you're contributing a hundred K a year to the family, uh, or even as a, as a single woman, if you are making a hundred K a year, you have to me a very serious business that will also most likely be enduring. If you are making a hundred K a month, then you have a business that is likely to be ongoing. So, so many businesses start and fail and, uh, I'm really here to empower women to have their own business, to have their own wealth, to have their own money. And to if they're going to be in business and spend all that time, money, emotional angst <laughs> that goes along with being an entrepreneur, I want there to be something to show for it. So yeah, so it's, uh, it's really important to me to help women uh, create wealth. And uh, I also believe that women are very generous. And I know men are too. But women are especially generous. And so when we put more money in the hands of women, uh, it tends to go out into the world in a different way. And so I feel like we're also changing the world when we empower women to make more. Everybody listening knows that's really my exact mission too. Um, you know, obviously I focus on the financial piece and not so much the overall business strategy, sales marketing piece. I think both are super important to being successful. And so I'm with you. And I think we could have a whole podcast episode just talking about that. Yes, <laughs> but I agree. Could. I think um, <laughs> women paying themselves six figures is, I think, really important. And it's something that a lot of people struggle with, you know, if they're if they're married, especially and their spouse has a good job. Mm -hmm. This idea of like, oh, I don't need to do this. Why do I need to? And that's yeah, there's a whole lot of reasons why. So 
you know, I think that the profitability piece is really important. And, you know, we see, I see a lot of messaging out on social media land about, you know, sales and marketing and how that creates wealth and generational wealth. It's like almost a buzzword. And I actually think that's, it's one, it's one important piece. Like you're not going to have a profitable business without good sales, but you also need to make sure that your money's not flying right back out the door and that you are focusing on paying yourself in order to be able to build wealth. So that I won't go, I won't get on a soapbox about that. I could, <laughs> but I won't. So we're, we want to talk about why it is important to specialize and or niche your business and specifically how that will help you grow your business, but grow it more profitably than you could otherwise if you did not specialize or niche. Um, so I love this topic. I'm excited to talk about it. So first things first, tell me the difference between specializing and niching. So you specialize by the type of work that you do and you niche by who you do it for. So who you're serving. And when you put them together, you have a specialized niche, which I call an automatic yes business because you are really an expert in what you do and who you do it for. You become very known for that and you can consequently charge higher prices because there are, there's very little or no competition. And so uh, that is the main thing I'm wanting uh, business owners to think about is how we do not want to be interchangeable with someone else because then you're a commodity, right? So if I'm a business coach that can help anyone do anything, how do you compare me to anybody else? And uh, for you as a CFO, you know, if you do uh, taxes and CFO services for anybody anywhere, well, one, because you're in a business where people have to have you, you will actually still grow, but it will impact a lot of other things in your business, especially hiring team members who cannot work with all the people doing all the things. So it gets harder to build an actual firm or company when you were a generalist. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I've gone through that too. I mean, I started my business late 2018 as a side hustle and I had no idea even what a business coach was back then. But I remember, you know, I'm a CPA. And so I was like, I'll just hang my sign out as a CPA and do what all CPAs do. And I remember looking at other people's websites, which by and large are just horrible. And their service offerings are literally everything under the sun. It's like going to the Cheesecake Factory and like choosing from a menu. And so I did that. And I very quickly, I've, I've done like past podcast episodes on this, but I very quickly ended up getting burned out. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't charging very much. And it was very much the commodity factor of like, I'm doing bookkeeping and tax prep for anybody. And so, you know, you can't compete on price that way. Are you ready to create a profitable business and use that cash flow as a fire starter for building your wealth? Since you're listening to my podcast, I'm guessing that you probably do, but maybe you aren't sure exactly how this would work for your business or if it's even possible for you. But listen, I am here to tell you that it is possible because I have worked with so many women business owners who have done exactly that. You can pay yourself a six-figure CEO salary and get yourself out of the feast or famine cycle where you're worrying about cash flow all the time. You can create a profitable business model that allows you to outsource and delegate so you can take time off from your business while still growing to the next level. And you can use that cash flow to start building a seven-figure portfolio of retirement, real estate, or whatever else you're interested in. If you're an established online or service-based business owner who likes some hands-on CFO support to increase your profit margins, build your business to the next level, and grow your net worth using that extra cash flow, then the Millionaire CEO Incubator is exactly for you. The Millionaire CEO Incubator is my signature six-month group coaching and done-with-you hybrid program to help you map out and implement a plan to turn six-figure cash flow into seven-figure wealth. We take on a handful of new clients each month by application. So if you're ready to change your money story, go to profitandprosper.co forward slash apply or the link in the show notes and fill out the quick application. It should take no more than two minutes and we'll be in touch. Now let's get back to the episode. So do you have to specialize and niche or can you do one or the other? You don't. No, you don't. And uh, it you can build a business either way. And some of it, a lot of it involves experimentation. So uh, 
Let me just share really quickly another example of another industry that tends to be very broad. It's therapists. Go to any like marriage and family therapist website. They work with couples. They work with individuals. They work with children. They work with anybody, basically. I remember when I was looking for a therapist for my daughter and uh, she was a teenager. She gives me permission to share this. I was looking for a therapist for her and I wanted someone with an expertise in teens because teens are different. I don't want just some generalist working with my teenager. I needed someone that understood how social media was impacting her high school experience, um, what other teens were saying. And so I searched and it was very challenging to find someone who specialized in teenagers and I found them. And honestly, I was willing to pay a higher price for that expertise. Um, but back to, do you have to specialize or do you have to niche or both together? You can do either or. Um, so example, like in for one way to niche, which is not just the who, it can be the size of business. So for example, in your industry and in, in what I do, I want to focus on people that have an established business. So the type of coaching I would do if someone was just starting out versus someone that has a million dollar business, the issues they're struggling with are different. And I've learned over time and I, I've, I've honestly coached at all those levels. And I have learned what I love doing the most and what I consider my zone of genius, what I am, I am an expert in. I love strategy and I love when things are kind of complicated and paths can go in different directions. So in my program, I work with women who are at five figures in revenue and want to create stability in their business. And we help them create a retainer business model or a high ticket project business. And so I initially started off this program serving any entrepreneur. So we had product businesses in there. We had people with physical locations. We had interior designers who are really a product and a service business at the same time. And over time, we have cold it down to a group of service providers who can understand each other's businesses, help one another. And the coaching is very similar. So they are co consultants, marketers, and financial professionals, including people like you, bookkeepers, CPAs. And I love helping the CPAs move to becoming uh, fractional CFOs because it's such, yes. a, <laughs> such a great business. <laughs> it is. It is. Yeah. I mean, mine is that way too. You know, I said I started off doing anything and everything. And I think we do a little bit both of both specializing and niching. I know there's people out there who, who do it even more than we do. But our services are pretty tailored. Like our CFO service is targeting really a dollar value of you're doing a million dollars in revenue or close to it. Like you will be doing a million dollars in the next year and you need that support and you have a yes. growing team. And those businesses also tend to be service-based. Um, and my team, we have multiple accountants on staff. And so we have some who focus like on the B2B service providers, consultants, that type of business. And then other ones who will focus on like the B2C services. Like we have some practitioners, chiropractors, therapists, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, and like, for me, I can do both. I don't feel like it necessarily hurts me to do both. I have had um, like restaurants and we even at once I dipped my toe into manufacturing and I very quickly Ooh. was like, because that's my background in my corporate life oh, was okay. well, at Deloitte. My clients were manufacturing, okay. um, were manufacturing clients. So I was like, well, I could do this. And I was like, you know what? I really don't. I don't want to do this. I don't want to deal with the inventory. And the cost accounting. And so after about six months, we were like, yeah, let's not do this. Um, and so it is, you said it's a, it's a testing process. It's trial and error mm -hmm. of figuring yes. out, I think, what the best thing is. And so we have sort of niched down that way. And then with our other offers, um, it tends to be, you know, certain smaller revenue levels for specific, like our tax package and my group program, you know, smaller revenue, but still in the same service-based type of of business and the business owner for me too is important. Most of them are women and I really like them to be at least open to the idea of investing because that helps us from like a tax strategy standpoint, but also like yes. wealth building standpoint and all of that. If they're not doing it already, at least open to the idea. So mm. for everybody listening, there's another example of how it's done. I see other CFOs who like, we do only digital marketing. We do only lawyers. I think that's fine too. I just don't feel necessarily called to do that because I feel good about where we're at. So first, I want to talk about why people don't do this. Mm -hmm. um, and then I want to talk about how to do it and how it impacts not just your sales, but your profitability and your ability to pay yourself. But before that, like, why do people not 
specialize or niche? It feels very limiting initially. And it feels that you're saying no to potential business. And and you may, you may say no. And so those feelings that we might have around scarcity and any experiences we have in our past where um, there may have been times of scarcity, any messaging we have from growing up about money and um, growth around money comes into play. And those messages from childhood are so powerful. And my clients that have grown up in poverty or in foster care or um, had big highs and lows of money going in, in and out of the family, they it's going to be harder for them to make these decisions and they may do it a little slower. So when I coach, I coach with care around that. Um, and so that's why we can't be comparing ourselves to other people because we're on our own journey. It feels like our brain is telling us it makes more sense to just cast a wide net because then more people will come to me. But it's so counterintuitive and the opposite is true. The more you specialize or niche or both, the easier you are to refer business to because I can put you in a box in my mind. So I'm what I call an Uber connector. Uh, I'm sure either you are or you know other people who are, Sarah. And I keep a lot of people's businesses and just details about them in my head. And I'm constantly looking for connections. So if someone tells me they are a bookkeeper, I will, I actually have the ability to refer a lot of people bookkeeping services. And I, I, it's one of the requirements of my group coaching program. I need my clients to have a bookkeeper because I don't want to do their books and I'm not going to, nor do I know how, uh, <laughs> I can read the reports, but I need someone else looking at their numbers and advising them. And so I can focus on coaching. So when I am looking for, to refer a bookkeeper, I would prefer to refer, refer someone who specializes in that industry or doesn't do all the things, right? That they have some special knowledge that would help that client. For, if we think about, um, I work with a lot of marketers, so they usually end up uh, specializing by platform. And sometimes we'll niche by industry, but at a minimum, they will niche. I move them to niche by the size of business. So that also helps create stability. We have to remember who we're doing work with. Um, we need to think about the size of their business because if they have a lot of flex in their business, then we're going to experience that. So uh, one of the things that I help clients do is move to that, like focusing on businesses, their clients being multi six figure or seven figure that they are providing services for. So I think um, I heard you say it was a scarcity mindset, right? Of the mm -hmm. fear. I think it comes down to the fear of failure, which is really a scarcity mindset of if mm -hmm. I don't serve everybody, then who am I going to serve? And, you know, you cast a wide net thinking people will come. And to be clear, I think people will come. Counterintuitively, more people will come. And you probably can charge, like you said already, a higher price for having fewer people and it makes it easier for you to make sales and profit. I think by niching, I think this, the scarcity mindset and just the, the fear of what if it doesn't work. And so I'll tell you kind of what I did when I went from doing it all to specializing. I didn't just all of a sudden one day fire all of my existing clients no. <laughs> and start offering, you know, CFO only. I did it sort of stepwise. You know, I had contracts and I wanted to do right by people and so I tried to time, you know, letting go of the bookkeeping and tax clients, like not when it's coming up on year end, not when I'm going to leave them in a bind. And so, you know, I started with, I got my first CFO client, it was $4,000 a month. And I, it was a referral um, from a friend who's a business coach. And it was, I had done project work, but not like a retainer before. And so I remember mm -hmm. thinking, oh my God, somebody's going to pay me $4,000 a month. I can't believe it. And now, I mean, it's, like more normal, right? I have even higher ones than that at this point, which Sarah from two years ago would have thought you were insane. Um, yes. And so I got the first one and focused there. I didn't, I just stopped taking bookkeeping clients on really and mm -hmm. kept the ones we had. I got the first CFO client. We focused on doing, you know, well for them and defining like, what is our CFO retainer process and what things are we doing on a monthly, weekly basis for them? Um, and then over time, I started selling CFO services and keeping my existing bookkeeping clients. And then after I got a couple CFO clients, I started letting bookkeeping clients go. Yes. After we finished the 
it was 2021 when I did this. So it would have been 2020 tax returns. As I finished 2020 tax returns, um, I started letting tax prep only clients go, you know, just sort of slowly piecemeal, like stepping one, one foot here and take some, take, take some away here. But you'd think that I would be like keeping my revenue flat as I did that because I was like taking clients on, letting clients go. I ended up being able to, from early 2021 to the fall, I think I doubled or tripled my monthly, yes. my monthly revenue by doing that, even though I let all these clients go. Yeah. It's, uh, I think for some people it can be really hard to think, oh, well, I love all my clients. I don't know who I wouldn't serve. And so to just start with a list of who you do not want to work with. So, you know, in, for um, bookkeepers and CPAs, it's, it's often, I don't want to do retail. I don't want to do restaurants. I don't want to do construction, maybe not manufacturing. So like there's a list that you, you know, and so that's great because you've started the process. You now can eliminate that. You might not want to do product businesses, or you might decide I love product. I love inventory. So I'm going to focus on that. And then you might eliminate service businesses. So you also might want to work with people who have physical locations or not work with people who have physical locations. There's a lot of ways to get to this. And I love how you shared it's a stepping stone process to uh, transitioning your business to being specialized or niche because we do not want to annihilate our business ever. So we need to take care and watch to make sure that we have enough revenue coming in and one of the one of the ways that we can do this is by how we are sharing about our business publicly. So you have your book of business that you currently have, but you can start on social media or in however you're communicating about your business to share the new direction you're going. You will still get referrals and your client current clients will stay with you, but your public facing you are sharing the new direction. And that seems to be a really great way for it to work. And then over time, letting clients know we're not going to renew this contract or, uh, you know, this also is a very similar process to raising prices. It's one of the things that I find that most women, and I bet you're seeing this too, uh, are undervaluing their work. And so <laughs> Sarah just rolled her eyes. <laughs> so it, it's, yeah, it happens all the time. Yeah. And yeah. I, yeah. I have this conversation. Like I feel like every day of my life. So mm -hmm. you keep going. I'm with you. Majority of women are undervaluing themselves in the marketplace and there's statistics on this. Uh, I have a podcast I did, um, a long a couple years ago called why women create their own glass ceiling. Like we are creating a glass ceiling for ourselves. We are entrepreneurs, have our own businesses, but we are not valuing ourselves highly enough. And I think that's one of the benefits of specializing or niching because you start to really know you are an expert. You know more than other service providers that do what you do. And it gives us confidence to raise those prices. But along the way to, if you are in the process of raising prices with clients, we don't have to do it all at once. And we can charge people different prices. There's no pricing police out there. So, uh, this is a agreement between two businesses or an individual and a business. And you can, I always say charge as much as you can afford as, as much as people will pay. I love helping people raise prices. It's something I also do continuously in my work. Yeah. Well, going back to the, the testing, um, mm -hmm. the testing approach, I, I take that with pricing too in my own business. And we talk about this with clients as well. It's like, you know what, if there's any hesitation around increasing your prices, I'm like, what's the worst thing that happens? Let's talk through what that actually looks like. The worst thing that happens is you send out your proposal. Somebody says, no, it's priced too high. Maybe you do it a few times and you repeatedly get no's. And that's your, your feedback to say, okay, something needs to change. Either I need to communicate my value better. It's, a, it's the messaging or, you know, maybe you need to take your price down a little bit in the meantime, you know, like it's just, you don't have to be stuck to a price. Like I've certainly done that. I've had times where energetically I said, I cannot take on any more clients. So I'm not taking anybody on for less than like 5k a month, basically. <laughs> and obviously I had leads come in during those times who couldn't afford or didn't need the level of service that we provide at 5k a month. And so I lost business. And then you know, after a while I said, okay, energetically, like I needed to give myself a break. Now we'll pull back a little and go back to our sort of, you know, lower price tiers of service that we offer. So you're not stuck with anything. 
And I think something else I talk about too, as you were talking, this brought up is when you're sort of solopreneur, you're starting your business. I think you get to that ceiling of like, what is the absolute max that you can probably do by yourself? And Mm -hmm. I work with business owners who hit that ceiling and it's, you know, helping them figure out how do we make the numbers work to get them to the next level And counterintuitively, it is not about doing more of what you have already done. And so I think some of the thing, because like you might think, well, I just need to bring on double the clients to make double the revenue, right? And maybe like the math maybe works, but again, you may not have the team or the processes or all the things in place to make that happen. And so a lot of times what we focus on is exactly what we're talking about, raising your prices, niching, specializing, making things more Mm -hmm. streamlined um, to make it easier for you to grow. So I think that's a really good segue into the question of like how let's talk about the the benefits of yes. specializing and niching first on revenue. And then I want to talk about on profitability. So how does this make it easier to make more sales in your business? I'm going to take a step back before I answer that question, if that's okay, because what we're really doing is positioning your business. So we're positioning you in the marketplace so that you are known and easily referable and the benefit of this, I have, a, I have a graphic that I share with our clients and it's like a waterfall. So your positioning is at the top and imagine like the most beautiful waterfall you've seen and kind of along the waterfall and at the bottom are all the different things positioning impacts. So it impacts your website. It impacts your, um, what events you go to, like, why would you go to an event if your ideal clients aren't going to be there or referral partners? It impacts what referral partners you might connect with. It impacts um, just how you say yes and no to any opportunities. It impacts your messaging on social media. So it has this whole waterfall effect positioning. And one of those things that also can impact is revenue and profit, right? Because it honestly, the only way, the way to really encapsulate it is that it makes doing business easier. Your business becomes easier and referrals will just start landing in your lap because of the clarity your network has around you. I will say when you are a generalist, people may be nervous about referring you because they're not sure that you really know your stuff. And I, as a re- person who refers a lot, I want to refer the, make the best match. I'm a matchmaker, right? I want to make the best match possible. So if I have a person who's asking for, um, say help with social media and I determine that really, I might ask a few questions and they're really saying, well, really it's LinkedIn. I mean, I can name probably 25 or 30 social media marketers that I know and have worked with or interacted with over the years. Now, since they said LinkedIn, I am thinking of four, which of those four or all four might I refer to this person? So that's how my brain works when I'm referring and how most of us are. I don't, I'm not going to send them to the Instagram specialist or someone who does Facebook ads because that is not what they need. And that's not going to be a good match. I think it's important to think about how referrals work. We, I call it relationship marketing and really, um, connecting deeply with your network And so once you have that dialed in (laughs) and you continue to connect and interact with your network, it becomes this, I call it like a magical thing that just starts to happen. The, the work will come to you. The revenue will come to you. It will be easier and you can charge higher prices, which increases the top line and hopefully the bottom line too. The other thing that helps with profitability is with your team. So as you're hiring people, as you specialize and or niche, You don't need to train people to do everything. So as entrepreneurs, we are special unicorns. We generally can do all the things in the business and we can work with lots of different types of people. When we hire people, that is usually not the case. They need to be trained and it's so much easier to train them on say one industry or one size of business or this type of work or combine those all together. And so that becomes more profitable and you will have more satisfied team members and less turnover. So there's a lot of aspects to how this impacts your business, which is why it's literally the first thing I do when I work with clients is to make sure we have that dialed in. And I'll be honest, sometimes with clients, it's fast. We do it right away. And other clients struggle with the process and it could take them, you know, nine months or a year for us to, they're experimenting or they're resisting. Uh, and it can take time to land on really what they love to do and who they love to do it for. 
Something that came up for me as you were talking was a lot of us have this idea in our head that business should be hard. Mm. You know, one of my, like I said, I had a corporate background, big four accounting, like you work, you make money because you work. The more you work, the more successful you are. Billable hours. Oh my God. So we all have, uh, not we all, but probably 90% of business owners have that mentality of, you know, I have to work hard to make money. Yes. And so there is also this weird internal resistance that I find for myself. I see a lot in clients of if we think about niching, it's going to make your life easier because once you set up the process for how to work with an agency, I'll use myself as an example. How do we work Mm -hmm. with agencies? How does my accounting team, how do the bookkeepers, how do we do the chart of accounts? How do we set up the reporting? What are the KPIs that we track? It's the same for every business you know, tweaking a few things here and there, but by and large, it's the same process. It makes it easier for me when I'm looking at forecasts, we're doing cash forecasting. It's the same ins and outs for every type of business. And so there's also this resistance that comes up for me very frequently of, you know, I have to be aware of it um, and make sure I'm not unintentionally going to make things hard for myself. But this resistance of like, well, this is too easy. How can I not only charge more money, but work less? Like, how does that make sense? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, this is so good. What I want us all to focus on is the value and transformation we are providing to the client. So it's not all about how long it takes you. So when you work with a client, Sarah, and when I work with a client, they are getting access to all of our education, all of our previous experience, all of our mistakes, all the coaching we've paid for, all of the trainings we've done all of the books we've read, everything in that moment, they are accessing that and we are saving them time. And so they're not just paying for the minutes, the the billable hour of work that we're doing for them. They are tapping into all of that. And so usually the people that I work with do things faster than most other people in their industry. So they would not want to be paid by the hour. So it's one of the things I, I work to help them not be paid hourly The thing, again, we're hitting into mindset issues, right? And messaging from growing up because we are taught that there's many of us were taught you need to work hard. Like it needs to be hard. Like working hard means it is hard to do. And that's like a childhood interpretation in a way. So there is some work to do around that, some personal growth and internal growth as a, as an entrepreneur to, to do and some time to spend doing that. Even journaling, like Where did that messaging come from? Who said that? Is it okay if your work is easy? Is it okay if someone pays you a lot of money, but you do it fast? Honestly, when I pay service providers, I don't care how long it takes them. I just want it done. What matters to me is what, did I get what I paid for? And I want it to be correct. And if it's not, I'm going to send it back. So that is really then our issue, our own issue to work on and to work out. I was doing a um a workshop for a group a couple of weeks ago and we were we came up somebody asked me a question about pricing and she said something along the lines of you know how do I get to where I'm increasing my price to do value based pricing but I just I feel like I'm just extracting more money from them without you know giving them anything good in return hmm. and I think that the use of the word extraction, I I remember because I remember thinking like, wow, like that's a real, I think that's an internal mindset. It's <laughs> like thing pulling to a tooth. <laughs> yes. Well, I think it's, you know, I see people talk about like corporate America extracting, et cetera, et cetera. Like I, I totally understand where that's coming yeah, from, but for sure. I think, you know, going back to what is the value that you do provide, like you said, and I think specializing or, you know, niching down to be very, it allows you to be very clear on this is the value that you provide, right? So we do fractional CFO services um, for, let's say, agency owners. It's a big group of our clients. Mm -hmm. And, you know, from there, I can give specific examples of here's the profitability increase. Here's where we benchmark your numbers. And if we benchmark and your overall like profit and pay, it should be probably 30% or so based on the business size. And yours last year was 10. And so if we can get you to that Mm -hmm. benchmark, if we can dive into your numbers and get you up to that 30% on a million dollar business, that's $200,000 of value that we're bringing. And I'm not charging 200,000. And interestingly, like when we look at expenses and we look at those profit benchmarks, like our fee is included in the expenses. 
So I think coming up with a way to sort of like think about it that way, I think it's easier if you specialize or if you niche and then, you know, it helps you increase your price, which then enables you to hire more people and they're more efficient, right? If they're doing the same process over and over again, instead of coming to work every day, like, what am I doing today? Is it going to be this or this other thing over here, right? Basically, to sort of summarize, if we if we do sort of counterintuitively serve a smaller group of people, it helps your sales. I think volume-wise, obviously, it's easier to refer. I think you said your messaging is more consistent. And even if people are looking at your website, like, your ideal client, it speaks to them because you can tailor your messaging to exactly that. I would imagine it helps you close more sales. Like you're on a sales call and your conversion rates are probably going to be higher. It helps you. So it helps you serve, you know, a higher volume of people. It helps you increase your pricing. And so there's the two factors that are going to increase your revenue, volume and pricing. And then on the expense side, it enables you to grow by hiring more people because you have more sales, but then they're able to work more efficiently because they have standardized processes. They're doing the same thing every day. So ultimately it is about profit, right? So I think somebody who's solopreneuring, like you said, this is one of the first things that you do with clients. Let's do this as like one of your first things to specialize, refine your offers, and then increase your prices. And that will ultimately make you more profitable. I'm so on board with this. Yes. And joy. So we're not going, this should all be with a group that you love serving. So in order to have an enduring business, it needs to be enjoyable, profitable, and sustainable. If you don't like working with these people, let's not do it. (laughs) Like there's, there's enough ways to build a business that I I just want to make sure it's not always about profit. You know, it's not only about profit, but it does need to be profitable. So We need to find the intersection of all of that. And it does, it can take time to figure this out and to know that we have time. We have enough time. Think about how long you might want to have a business. It doesn't have to be done this year, this month. There's so much messaging out there about like doing things fast and building a business fast and it doubling and tripling and quadrupling. Like it does not have to be that way. I, I really and wanting women to stay in business. And that's my ultimate goal is that if they, if they want to have a business that they stay in it, a few other layers that we didn't talk about in terms of like work being hard is people just staying busy to stay busy. And so I, one of the questions I like to ask clients when I notice they're very busy and I seeing that maybe they don't need to be, I will say, if I was able to get you more time, what would you do with that time? That's such a good question. And I am going to tell you, you, I want you to answer, like keep going, but I struggle with answering this for myself. So yes. Yes. Because for some of us, we're being busy to be busy. And this is why I, so I'm a huge advocate for therapy. I've done a lot of therapy. That's why I know so much about all the therapists and their websites. But when you grow as a woman, as a person, it will help your business. So getting clear on if I gave you more time, what might you do? And then would, could we get that on the calendar? Uh, sometimes we're being busy to hide from things we don't want to face. Sometimes we have struggles in our personal life that being busy at work is helping. And sometimes it's just like, I am a workaholic. I have to be careful about that. I love my work. I sometimes don't want to leave and stop working. I really truly am doing the exact kind of work I would do. I would do for free. But thankfully, I don't, I get paid for it. (laughs) Uh, But I, I also, um, I am working on doing more, finding more of the fun in my personal life because my business is so fun. So creating fun in my personal life. And then also in terms of, I think there can be some guilt that happens when we had parents that maybe worked three jobs or we saw our, a parent work a very physical job. And they were exhausted at the end of the day. And you can feel a little guilty that your business is a lot easier. Um, But I can tell you, if you would ask your parent, like, actually, like, is it okay for me to make all this money and for it to be easy? If we, if we had that conversation, my guess is they would, they would bless that. They would say, I don't want you to be so tired at the end of the day. You have no, nothing left for your family. So I think that it's important to kind of 
go back and see where things come from and spend some time doing that. And the more you do that over time, the easier all of this becomes. The mindset issues do not go away. You will keep having them. You don't see other people having them. That's one thing I try to help normalize because so many people share things with me. And I know as a, a CPA and a CFO, you, I mean, it's intimate, like you're in people's money, you're seeing it all and just helping them to helping them to take some time to look back and that, you know, you don't know what else is in someone else's head. You only know what's in yours, but I will just say that. And I bet you will agree. The back end of every business is a mess, a hot mess. Just yep. only, only the coaches and the um, operations people and the financial people see it. And we're all struggling with mindset, but we can get faster at resetting it. We can, it's not going to go away, but we can get faster at working through those issues. Yeah, that was so good. I think those, the two points, those were so good. And I so agree. I think we all struggle with that, whether it's, you know, coaching, but therapy too. I'm, I have been to therapy. I advocate for it. You know, I'm at a point where I'm also in Q1 of 2023. I don't need to necessarily do anything new in my business. I just need to keep mm -hmm. honing in on doing what we do and doing it well. And I know that yes. we'll grow without me having to try that hard. Um, that is a hard thing for me. You know, I, I'm, I'm a workaholic too. And I talked about this in one of my recent podcast episodes, how in 2022, I procrastinated hiring tax people for my team because I was like, I can do it. It's only this many per week. I have this, like, why do I need to outsource it? But then it ultimately lost me easily. I easily lost out on 50K, if not 100K of revenue. And that would have yeah. been at least 75, 80% cash flow to my bottom line. Like that is painful <laughs> to me when I sit, I'm still <laughs> coping with it. So in, in this, in this quarter, like, you know, I'm acknowledging that getting over it. I think to your point, the mindset work is it's never going to end, but having the practice of whether it's journaling or going to therapy, meditating, like going to yoga, like whatever it is for, for people, I think it's really mm -hmm. important to learn that of realizing like some of the things we've talked about, when are they coming up for you? And, you know, how can we just acknowledge it and then reframe it, like come at it from a different way, I think is so, um, so important. And one, one thing I say, this is, this will be sort of my last thing. Cause I know we're kind of getting long. We could, I could, I could do all day about this topic, but Me too. one thing I ask, <laughs> <laughs> I love to ask clients, especially cause it comes at the mindset thing too. And it helps support us like to do the hard things in business especially for women, I like to sit and talk about what is the money for? Mm -hmm. Like, really, what is the point? Like, what's the purpose of you making this money in your business? And a lot of people look at me at first with like deer in headlights. I don't know. I've never thought about it. I just wanted to be able to quit my job. Like, well, that's great. Right. So let's get clear on, is it to support your family? Is it to allow your spouse to quit their corporate job? Right. I did that in 2022. That was my biggest win of the year was my husband Huge was win. able to leave his corporate job in March because my business was stable and like, he's still doing work. It's just, we don't have to have that steady corporate paycheck and the benefits and all that stuff. And so getting clear on like, what is it? Is it to retire early? Is it to give your kids an inheritance? Is it to make massive donations to a charity? What is it? Yes. Having that like deeper why I think helps us to counteract the, the guilt or the fear of doing some of these hard things. So mm. all of this has been so good. Um, my last thing I want to ask is just sort of very next steps, like wrapping it up. Somebody's listening. They're on board with doing this very next steps today that they could do, you know, for, to take them through the next month to get started down the path. What would you tell them? I would like them to really think about what they love doing and maybe even make a list of their clients and think about, I, here's one of my favorite things. And this is kind of new that I've been doing with clients. I ask them to rate their clients on one to five stars. So we're rating everything one to five stars these days, right? Rate your clients and rate your team. If you have any team members, uh, anything that's less than a four, I want to know why we are still working with this person or have this person still on our team. Look at the clients that you're not enjoying working with and let's understand why. Also look at the clients that you love. Another thing I, I, I like to ask people, and this is a, you could write this down and, and journal out your answer. If I could wave my magic wand and give you a full book of business of the exact clients you would love to work with ongoing, who would it be? Assume there's enough of them. So tell me who those are. Finally, as you're doing this process, you need to make sure that people are looking for your services. 
We should not have to educate people on why they need us. There should be people out looking for you. So, and very specifically, usually you're solving some type of product pro problem. So I have clients that are leadership consultants. Who is out just looking for a leadership consultant? I don't know who is. I don't know how to refer you. You need to be solving something that organizations are struggling. They're literally out looking for you to solve their problem. So make sure that you have that connection there. You can also plot your business on a grid. So remember in school, the X axis and the Y axis. So, so put generalist on the left, specialist on the right, top down on the bottom, put work with anyone and top is niched. Where would, which quadrant are you in? You should not be in the bottom left. Do not be there. Generalist work for anyone. We want you really to be in those top, one of those top tiers, the, the top quadrants. Um, but definitely if you're in that bottom quadrant, you know, there's some work to do and some changes that we'll want to make in your business. Yes. All of this was so good. And I appreciate all of the knowledge and experience that you brought today. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I know that people will get a lot out of this. So before we go, my question I love to ask everybody is, you know, back to the question of what's your money for, but in a fun way. So tell us something that, what is a life upgrade that your business has afforded you or that you want to afford you? Like I always say, mine is my lake house that I don't have yet, but it's coming. I'm, <laughs> I'm manifesting it. It's coming. So tell me what yours is. Well, I like to upgrade uh, airline tickets. So I love flying first class. So in, when I travel for business, I usually travel first class or business. And when I travel with the family, I'm able to usually upgrade us to premium. When I travel alone, I usually fly first class. My husband is not on board with flying first class all the time. Um, I'm working on him. So uh, I love upgrading travel. Um, and then really the thing that is truly on my heart for the next eight to 10 years. So uh, my boys are currently eight and almost 11. And because I also have an adult daughter who's in college, she's 20, I know how fast it goes. And this, this age they're at right now is a very special age. And so thinking through some international trips that I want to take with them. And because I have been at this for a long time, I have former clients, listeners all over the world. What we're working on right now as a family is where are the next, you know, four to five trips we want to take with our boys. And I want to take them internationally to experience some great things. So I have Australia on the list and I have Belfast, Ireland on the list because I have a client there. And then another client said I need to take them to Iceland. So um, I am working on combining some personal and business travel. Uh, but really thinking intentionally about experiences. So I like to pay for experiences and thinking about where, you know, before they leave home, what are some really amazing experiences we could have as a family? Yeah, I love that. Mine is two. He'll be three in a, about a month and a half. And that's, he's still a little too little to enjoy travel, but it's one of the things like I have places I want to travel to and my husband's been all over the world. He was in the Marines. So he's like traveled wow. to all over the place and I have not. And so I'm like, well, you know what? I want to take him to all these places. You can come or not. I love the idea of upgrading <laughs> to first class. I've personally never done that. I haven't been on a plane since 2019 though. So <laughs> we got to work on that one. Um, but no, I love that and enjoy life, right? To your point of let's enjoy our life and not just have fun in business. It's about the experience along the way. So that's so good. Well, tell us real quick where we can find you. Well, we're listening to a podcast. So if you are, um, if you are listening right now, wherever you're listening, you could search for the biz chicks podcast. We spell chicks with an X here. So B I Z C H I X.com. And then on our website at biz, bizchicks.com, we have, um, some courses and we have one called the automatic. Yes. So if you really wanted to walk through um, a training on this, it's a training we pulled out of our group coaching program just to offer to anyone there's a training on uh, specializing in niching. So uh, that would be something that someone could consider, but there's so much value on my podcast. Most people tell me that they could, they've like grown their business just by listening. And so I would love just for you to listen first and, um, and connect with me there and then connect with me on LinkedIn. I, that's where I hang out and spend all my time. So uh, tell, tell me that you heard Sarah and I here and um, I would love to be connected. 
Yes. And I'll share it on LinkedIn too. And, um, we'll put all the links and everything in the show notes. And I will also personally vouch for your podcast. Like I said, it was one of the first ones I ever found when I started listening to business podcasts and, you know, I love it. So I'm so, so grateful for your time. And like I said, all of the knowledge that you drop in an experience, it's so good and so valuable. So I'm so thankful that you were here. Thank you, Sarah. And to everybody else, I'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Now, I want you to go take some action. What's one thing you can do this week to create more profit in your business? Send me a DM on Instagram at youngcocfo and share your action item with me. If you have a question or topic you'd like me to dive into, or if you're feeling empowered about taking charge of your finances, let's continue the conversation. Go to profitandprosper.co to submit a question or topic for me to talk about on the show. And because we all profit and prosper better with friends, please leave me a review on Apple Podcasts, subscribe wherever you listen, and share the episode. Make sure you tag me at youngcocfo on Instagram so I can give you some love, and I'll see you in the next episode.